1961, MIT student Steve Russell and other members of the Tech Metal Railroad Club created Space War, considered by many people to be the first interactive computer game. To provide some context, in 1961, MIT was the proud owner of an IBM 704, the first mass-produced computer capable of handling complex mathematics, running on vacuum tubes, and reading instructions off of punch cards. Costing $2 million and weighing 15 tons, its equipment would fill a large room. On the surface, the Tech Model Railroad Club was just what it sounded like, founded in 1946 and made up of a few groups, some members built and painted replica trains, some built scenery and buildings, and those that created the circuits that the trains they built ran on. By 1961, this last group were particularly interested in figuring out how things work. In the club slang, a clever trick, improvement, or innovation was called a hack. Thus, the innovators of the club were the first hackers, originating the term and much of the culture that would grow with the spread of computers. In 1961, MIT was granted a PDP-1, far smaller than the 704, the size of a sedan instead of filling a room. It used ticker tape instead of punch cards, a control panel consisting of various dials and switches, and most importantly, had a CRT terminal instead of relying on paper output. The club took to it at once, using a nearby drawer to store reels of tape near the machine, where any member could revise and build upon the hacks of any other member. It was recent Dartmouth transfer Steve Russell who set out to prove his bona fides with the ultimate hack, creating an interactive game. Work on the game began the summer before the PDP-1 was even delivered, with Russell collaborating with fellow club members Martin Greitz and Wayne Wittanen. As mentioned, most compelling was the cathode ray terminal, which came with a program to display a kaleidoscope-like pattern to show off what it was capable of. Inspired to come up with a hack to display something more interesting, the three settled on a two-dimensional maneuvering demo, with the most obvious subject matter being spaceships. Russell had recently read E. E. Doc Smith's Lensman series about the space cops tracking down an intergalactic crime syndicate and felt that this would form a good basis for the program. Like many amateur game developers, though, his first instinct was to shop the idea around, casually mentioning it and talking it up in hopes that someone else would take care of the heavy work for him. However, as all game developers must eventually discover, Russell learned that ideas are useless on their own, and it's the implementation of these ideas that has value. Club pressure on Russell to sit down and do the work himself mounted, culminating in member Alan Kotak driving down to PDP-1 manufacturer DEC to pick up a tape of trigonometric functions Russell had said he needed to continue, slamming it down on the desk in front of him and demanding to know what other excuses he had. Trapped, Steve Russell was left with no other recourse than to invent video games. Now, there had been games before it. People have been trying to create computer games for as long as there have been computers, as an easily understood way of showing off what the machines can do. Alan Turing had written a computer chess program too powerful for the machines available in the 1940s. Nimrod, a computer capable of playing the simple mathematical game of Nim, was created for the 1951 Exhibition of Science in South Kensington. IBM engineers had spent two decades building a program capable of defeating Checker's masters, and William Higginbotham created an oscilloped tennis game for an open house at the Brooklyn National Laboratory in 1958. While all of these games could be played, even Turing's program with him taking on the role of the computer that would, could someday run it, each was meant for the artificial intelligence research and exhibition rather than entertainment. And they were all one-off prototypes that never saw distribution beyond their creators. Until Space War. After six months of development, Russell had a working prototype featuring two spaceships on the PDP-1 CRT monitor, controlled by two players using the computer's built-in switches. One to thrust, one to fire, and two for clockwise and counterclockwise rotation. As was custom with new and exciting hacks, the other members of the Tech Model Railroad Club modified and improved upon Russell's release. Pete Sampson, irritated with Russell's initially randomly generated Starfield, wrote a program to create more accurate ones based on real-world star charts. Dan Edwards added code to implement gravitational forces for the Starfield's central sun, and Martin Greitz gave the ships a hyperspace feature that would either destroy the ships or move them to a new random location when they were in great danger. Perhaps the greatest innovation, though, was one of hardware. As the PDP-1 lacked a keyboard, the initial controls switchers were awkwardly placed, hard to use, and wore out quickly. 
Bob Saunders created a detached control device for player use instead, in effect, the first gamepad. Space War was such a success among MIT students and faculty that the lab hosting the PDB-1 was forced to ban gameplay during the workday. But as members of the club spread out to other schools and joined the workforce, they brought copies of the game's tape with them, making it the first game to spread beyond the institution that had created it. As a program that used every aspect of the PDP-1 computer, it was adopted as a smoke test by DEC engineers on making sure that a new frame mainframe was working. Despite this, its restrictions to expensive and massive computers that just so happened to have CRT monitors, existing in mere dozens and all outside the consumer market, meant that its exposure was limited to a narrow band of academics. Academics, however, that would go on to become the luminaries of the video game industry.